Yeah, thanks, uh, um, church part three. Um, one, two, three, four, and five are the chapters that we had for tonight. I'm not going to sort of like uh, touch on all of them. I, I'm going to focus mostly on uh, Pentecost and uh, there will be a bit of a spillover. Um, I'll obviously, we'll touch on being filled with the Spirit because uh, I think that there's a difference between the initial baptism and when people say, are oh, you filled with the Spirit, they sometimes refer back to the initial baptism, whereas being filled with the Spirit is basically the state you're in at the moment. Okay, servants, friends, and brothers, in John 15, 20, uh, Jesus said, do you remember what I told you? The servant is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me naturally, they will persecute you. And if they'd listened to me, they would listen to you. In John 15, 13, he says, greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And then in uh, John 20, 17, it says, Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, um, in the book, in the notes, it kind of like puts these three down as a progression. I would tend to think that the brothers thing is more a case of pointing to the future because we are heirs and joint heirs and speaks about our, our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. But certainly there is um, a clear distinction in scripture of moving from a servant relationship into a friend relationship. Now the word servant is not popular, however that's exactly what ministry is, it's serving. And in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 3, Peter says this to the elders among you, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you. Now, remember, Peter was an elder, and he says uh, in that scripture, he said, I, um, who am also an elder, he doesn't refer to himself as an apostle. So, you know, like we have nowadays where people try and sort of like almost have ranks in the church. Uh, the only positions uh, and, um, uh, you know, that the scripture talks about is a, a deacon or an elder. Now, friendship with God, that scripture that I read earlier on, I'm going to read that whole thing in context. It says, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I've learned from the Father I've made known to you. So there's a clear indication here that as one moves into this relationship, that there is a, an awareness of God's will. And that's why you find, uh, you know, the apostles, you know, people like Paul, um, you know, hearing from God and knowing what God wants and, you know, being directed in the sort of like uh, missionary uh, and evangelistic activities to go into certain places and not to go into other places. Um, this isn't just something that happens. This is something as we get into a relationship with the Lord where there is a friendship. And that friendship is um, dependent upon our obedience. You are friends if you do what I command. So as we start living a life of obedience, we find that we move into this more intimate relationship with the Lord. And it's not just a case of doing things for the Lord. It's a case of really just doing what he wants instead of doing things for him it's Christ doing things through us. Now, Abraham was God's friend in James 2.23. It says, and the scripture was fulfilled. It says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him, credited to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. There's another reference to this friendship in Chronicles 27. Our God did not drive out did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And then in Isaiah 41, 8, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. 
So God had a deep friendship with Abraham, which afforded him great privileges. We find that Moses as well, it speaks of as having this friendship in Exodus 33, 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. I remember when uh, Miriam and uh, Aaron sort of criticized uh, Moses, um, the Lord got angry and he said, you know, uh, you know, to Moses, he speaks face to face. Other people, you know, he, he doesn't have that kind of relationship with. And this is a relationship that developed because of Abraham's willingness to, you know, enter into a deeper walk with the Lord. Now, just a couple of things about friendship. Friendship with God involves reverence. While we choose, uh, while we can enjoy closeness with God, our intimacy with him is also built on a deep reverence for him. Psalm 25, 14, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. God isn't our buddy. Uh, when we think in terms of a human relationship, this might be difficult to understand. After all, what does it look like to revere a friend? One way that helps to understand this is to think of what it is to make friends with a king. Now, Billy Graham was a close friend with a number of the presidents of the U.S. And so friendship with God doesn't mean we lose a sense of reverence for him. After all, he's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Proverbs 22, 11 says, One who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. Friendship with God involves correction. We've been brainwashed into thinking that friends must always be supportive and turn a blind eye to our faults. However, this wishy-washy notion of what love is um, and throws out the need for disciplining our children and correcting our friends is far removed from the counsel of God's word. In Proverbs 27, 5 and 6, it says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. I just think of what Jesus said to uh, Peter. Uh, you know, one minute he was commending Peter when he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then the next minute when he started speaking about going to the cross, um, Peter tries to dissuade him and he said, get behind me, Satan. So, you know, I think uh, most of us would be quite offended if the pastor referred to us as Satan. Now, friendship with God involves honoring him. As his friends, we always give him the glory and the place of honor. When John the Baptist was being compared to Jesus, he didn't claim glory for himself, but he exalted Jesus saying in John 3, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. And I mean, this was said in the context that some of his disciples came to him and told him that Jesus was baptizing more disciples than him, even though Jesus himself wasn't doing the baptism, it was his disciples. And this was his response. Sorry if I talk a bit funny, I, I had uh, a dentist appointment this afternoon and my my lips and my tongue are still numb and I've actually chewed my tongue, so I might have a bit of a lisp. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. So the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him, and he says that he must become greater, I must become less. It didn't bother him that Jesus was baptizing more disciples than he was. Jesus calls his disciples brothers. In John 20, 17, Jesus said, do not hold on to me. This is speaking to Mary, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And this is right at the end of Jesus' ministry after he has been resurrected from the grave. And Romans 8.23 says, We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So there is a sense in which we are waiting for our resurrection body so that we can realize that true brotherhood with Christ. Now, this, the Feast of Pentecost, or as the, Jewish, um, uh, as the Jews call it, Shavuot, 
was originally a festival for expressing thankfulness to the Lord for the blessing of the harvest. This celebration is tied into the giving of the Ten Commandments. And um, Jews believe it's the time that the Lord actually gave them the Torah. Um, it's uh, believed by rabbinic uh, scholars to be the day that the Lord gave the law to uh, Moses on Mount Sinai after their exodus. Now, they celebrate this on the 6th of um, the seventh month, which is seven. Now, Exodus 19.1 makes it quite clear that they actually arrived on the first day of the third month at Sinai, which would have been five days before the Feast of Pentecost. So they certainly were at Mount Sinai during this time. And this does have um, quite uh, a bit of significance, as we'll see. The Feast of Pentecost has parallels with the way a Jewish bridegroom made a covenant. Now remember, at Sinai, the Lord made a covenant with the Jews. And on the day of Pentecost, the church was born and 3,000 souls were uh, saved. And uh, the Lord had made a covenant with them as well. My laws are right on their hearts and their minds. So it's very interesting to see this parallel. It says, the Feast of Pentecost has parallels with the way Jewish, a Jewish bride made a covenant called a ketubah with his bride. Uh, Wikipedia says this about a ketubah. A ketubah is a Jewish marriage contract. It's considered an integral part of a traditional Jewish marriage and outlines the rights and responsibilities of the groom in relationship to the bride. In modern practice, the ketubah has no agreed monetary value and is seldom enforced by civil courts except in Israel. A covenant or a ketubah took place at Mount Sinai when God made a covenant with Israel in the month of Sivan, the month of Pentecost. This contract could not be fulfilled by Israel because of their wickedness and their rebellion, but God made plans for a new covenant, not like the one at Sinai. On the day of Pentecost, he sent his Holy Spirit to write his new covenant on the hearts of the church that was born as 3,000 souls were saved. Now, if we look at the old covenant, it was written upon tablets and it was sealed with the sprinkling of blood. It says in Exodus 24, then the Lord said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 and 70 of the elders of Israel, you are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain, set up 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood, put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So remember, this is on the day of Pentecost. But in Jeremiah 31, it says this, God said, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with your fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. And this new covenant is mentioned in Hebrews 8.10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And that's what being born again is. It's having God's law written into our hearts. Now, coming back to this whole thing of this covenant, this ketubah between the bridegroom and his bride, after the bridegroom gave his bride a contract, this ketubah, and made a covenant with her, he would give her gifts called a matan. The father would also give her gifts, and they were called a shaluhim. These gifts 
sustained the bride for the duration of their separation until their wedding day. The gift given by Jesus Christ and the Father was the gift of the Holy Spirit to sustain us till Jesus returns for his bride. This was fulfilled at Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of the Messiah. In Joel 2, 28, and Peter, when he stood up on the day of Pentecost, he quotes this and he says, what is happening here is a fulfillment of this. Afterwards, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons, your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So 50 days after the resurrection, on the Feast of Pentecost, 120 disciples were praying in the upper room. And that scripture was fulfilled. The Holy Spirit was poured out. And Peter then preached to the crowd. And 3,000 souls were saved. And on that day, the church, the bride of Christ, came into existence as God established a new covenant. And once again, a ketubah was made with a bride, with those who placed their faith and their trust in them. Now, how did Jesus fulfill this feast? Well, it says in John 1.33, And I myself, this is John the Baptist speaking, did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, looking at the Old Testament uh, um, week, uh, the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost, it was called the Feast of Weeks because obviously it was seven weeks, 49 days, that they would count after the Sabbath. And uh, then you would have it the day after, which would have been the Sunday. And as we have the uh, Pentecost Sunday. Notice what it says. You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. So that would have been a Sunday. From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So that would have been uh, from the Feast of First Fruits, Because the Feast of First Fruits was on the 17th of Nisan, which was the first day of the week, because that was the day Jesus rose from the grave. Seven Sabbaths, so that's why they called it the Feast of Weeks, 49 days after the Feast of uh, First Fruits. So 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, because remember the Sabbath was the day before the resurrection, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling two wave, uh, two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. So these two loaves were not free of yeast or leaven. They contained leaven. And there's a significance in that. The Greek term Pentecost means 50. And um, so we see there what I've just explained to you. And here we see these two loaves presented as a wave offering. Now, I believe that uh, these two loaves represent the Jews and the Gentiles, and the leaven typifies the fact that the uh, church and the Jews, for that matter, still contain uh, sin. In Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, I'll show you my reason for believing this. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one. So there's no more Jew and Gentile. In the church, these two groups have been united and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Because remember, the Jews had nothing to do with the Gentiles. They weren't even allowed to even go into their houses. Peter had to get a vision from the Lord before he went into the house of Cornelius. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16, by setting aside his flesh, the law with its commands, and regulations, sorry, setting aside in his flesh, his purpose was to create in himself one new huma humanity out of two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So the Feast of Pentecost took place seven weeks after the Feast of First Fruits and pointed to the great harvest, because remember this was a harvest festival. There was rejoicing and thanksgiving for the harvest. And so on this very day, 3,000 souls were harvested for Christ. 
And the gift of the Holy Spirit for both Jew and Gentile would be brought into the kingdom of God during the church age. Now, just looking at the feasts, I've been running through this with my own congregation. The feast of Passover had to do with our justification. The, that's been made right with God. The feast of unleavened bread had to do with our sanctification. And that is obviously the Lord is wanting to make us holy. The feast of first fruits had to do with consecration. And if you look at that, justification's got to do with our position with God. And it's about having peace with God. Whereas sanctification has to do with our condition. We are saved by our position, but God still wants to make us holy. And in doing so, we end up having the peace of God. And the Bible says the peace of God must be the referee in our lives. So when the referee blows his whistle, we know we've done something wrong and we stop and we get right with God. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, remember, had to do with them getting rid of all the leaven. And that speaks of putting off the old man, killing the flesh and the resurrection. And these things are typified in baptism. We go down into the water, we die, we are buried. And we come out of the water and we put on the new man. There's a resurrection life of Christ. But then we are ready for the following feast, which is the Feast of Pentecost. And that has to do with empowerment. And that is to do with our commission. It's the power of God given to us so that we can fulfill our commission to go into all the nations and make disciples. So just looking at, at briefly again, the Feast of Passover had to do with the peace with God. Feast of Unleavened Bread and Feast of First Fruits had to do with the peace of God. And the Feast of Pentecost had to do with the power of God. Now, no one, it says in Mark 2.22, puts new wine into old wineskins. And that's why these three feasts had to take place. We had to be born again. We had to put off the flesh. We have to put on the new man. Because then the new wineskin can contain the new wine. And the Lord wants to pour his Holy Spirit into our lives. It says, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. And this is why you find a number of things mentioned with regard to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter, first of all, tells them in Acts 2, 38 to 39, that they must repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are afar off, whom the Lord will call. So there has to be repentance. In Acts 5.32, Peter says, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit who, has been, who God has given to those who obey him. And I've heard people try and emphasize that you don't earn the Holy Spirit. That's true. But the fact of the matter is, we have to obey. And that obedience takes place because of the rebirth that's taken place in our lives. You know, in 2 Corinthians 7, it speaks about what happens when you're born again. It says you have vehement desire. There's, there's uh, you know, a transformation that takes place. Um, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, it says if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. All things have passed away. Everything's become new. So there is a change of desires. And... Um, I like what A.W. Towsley says, the, um, the problem with the church is not that they need a change of menu, it's a, that they need a change of appetite. The second thing that I see is that you have to ask. You first repent and then you must ask. In Luke 11, 9 to 13, Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Remember these guys, they waited for 10 days in the upper room. I mean, Jesus spoke to 500 people on the Mount of Olives when he, uh, well, on the Mount of um, Ascension, when he uh, said to them, don't, um, uh, he, he said, remain in Jerusalem until you've received the promise of the Father. But on the day of Pentecost, there were only 120. What happened to the other 380? So, you know, maybe 10 days was a bit too much to ask of them to pray and seek the Lord. And we need to ask. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So there is an earnestness. And this is borne out by the third thing that we'll look at just now. 
For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So this context is speaking about what we're talking about tonight, uh, receiving the Holy Spirit, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just want to have some water here, guys. John 7, on the last day of the greatest, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given for Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, while mentioning this, I have to say, what are you thirsty for? Because some people... They want to be baptized so that they can have a notch up on, you know, everyone else. And, hey, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the old days it was, you know, do you speak in tongues? And, you know, I'm one of those. And it's almost like having a, a, a rank in the church. The thirst must be for the purpose of the, the baptism. And the purpose of the baptism is evangelism, is to have power to be witnesses. And this is made quite clear as we go on in these scriptures. In Galatians 6.15, it says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Titus 3.5, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And what Gavin will uh, make clear later on is that there are different uh, aspects to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There is a working of the Holy Spirit in our lives before conversion. There is a working of the Holy Spirit in our lives at conversion. And then there is uh, another working of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives after conversion. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed his disciples not to embark on the Great Commission he had given them until they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49, I... I'm going to send you what my father has promised. Stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And he, in Acts 1 verse 4 to 8, once again speaks about them not leaving Jerusalem, but wait for the gift our father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There is a purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you find, uh, I haven't got the scripture here, but when I was ministering, uh, I think it was on Sunday, I spoke about the fact that Paul says um, he, he, he wanted to go and preach in places where Jesus hadn't been preached. You know, this was his desire. He, remember, he was filled with the Holy Spirit when Ananias prayed for him. And he had this desire. I worry about people who profess to have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and have got no passion for souls, no passion for the things of God. They're quite, you know, comfortable sitting back and waiting for the rapture. Acts 2 uh, verse 2 to 4, it speaks about the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And yeah, when um, people start saying they're drunk, he says, these people are not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. And he speaks about the fact that this is the fulfillment of that prophecy that we read in Joel, chapter 2. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out 
what you now see and hear. So Jesus is the one who has baptized us and who will baptize those who want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, the Old Testament revealed a shadow of the things to come through Christ. After Moses went up to Mount Sinai, the word of God was given to the Israelites at Shavuot. When the Jews accepted the Torah, they became servants of God. Similarly, after Jesus went up to heaven, the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost. When the disciples received the gift, they became witnesses for Christ. So the church was born. And this harvest was of newborn souls was celebrated on Pentecost. Okay, so there was this fulfillment of the feast of uh, Pentecost or the feast of weeks. God once more descended as He had at Sinai. This time, on the first century believers, with a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire, and other demonstrations of the Holy Spirit, again establishing a covenant with His people. We've looked at that already. Okay. Now, being filled with the Holy Spirit and winning the lost go hand in hand. Remember, we saw that. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now, the Charisma magazine, there is this article on evangelistic zeal. I want to read, being full of the Holy Spirit and winning the lost go hand in hand. Pentecostals read the book of Acts and believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are available for them today. They observe that the early church was focused on evangelism and believe they must behave and respond in the same way. Evangelism is their primary goal. Because of this focus, Pentecostal missions programs have dynamically entered unconverted areas of the world often at great risk, believing God would enable them to reach these areas for Christ. The very sad thing is that, you know, missions was born uh, in the churches, but missions have kind of like almost divorced themselves from the churches because the churches have become so lethargic. So you'll find that often these mission organizations, they obviously look to churches for support and they look to churches for people um, because they obviously need them. But there are many churches that have absolutely no mission vision. The idea is that church is, you know, preaching to the same bunch of people week after week and just hanging in there until the rapture takes place. Now, just a couple of things that you'll note, and I'm not going to read, uh, read through the scriptures. You can look at this when it's on the website. If you're filled with the Spirit, you will have boldness. If you're filled with the Spirit, um, you will overcome temptation. Because remember, it says Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, was led into the wilderness, and he overcame the temptation that came his way. If you're filled this with the Spirit, you'll be able to serve. I actually find it quite amazing that they were told to look for seven men full of the Holy Spirit who could actually wait on tables and make sure that the Grecian widows weren't overlooked. You know, most people think that they're too important to sort of like do menial tasks like waiting on tables and making sure that people get food. But this task, um, the Holy Spirit told them to actually choose seven men who were full of the Holy Spirit. And we see that one of these men were, were, was Stephen. And it says here in Act 6, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. And they mentioned six other men. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great signs, wonders and signs among the people. But he didn't think he was too important to wait on tables. And the fact of the matter is he went on to be the first martyr. Um, uh, he spoke boldly in Acts chapter 7. And, you know, they eventually uh, stoned him to death. And um, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll have joy. Um, Gavin might mention, you know, the difference between the fruits and the, the gifts. I actually found that quite interesting as well. It's interesting to note that historically, the truths of these feasts that I've just touched on this evening have been fulfilled. The Feast of Passover, which has to do with justification with God, was restored as a truth to the church because the church had fallen into terrible error and the Catholic church was full of uh, nonsense and, uh, you know, earning your salvation and uh, buying uh, uh, things to sort of like uh, get into heaven or to get people out of purgatory, etc., etc. 
And in 19, uh, 1916, I think that must be 1560, I meant to change this, so I, I forgot that the state is wrong. Martin Luther protest, protested the sale of indulgences, which triggered the Protestant Reforma Reformation. And that was justification by faith. And then we see later on the truth of personal holiness, which we saw in the Feast of Unleavened Bed and the Feast of First Fruits, putting off the old man, putting on the new man. This was restored through the ministry of the Wesley brothers. The early Methodist societies led by John and Charles Wesley were a missional movement. Their mission was not to form a new sect, but to reform the nation, particularly the church, and to spread scriptural holiness over the land. And then in the 19th century, 1906, J uh, William Seymour in Los Angeles, 1906, arrived to preach at a Nazarene church. He was not received because of his Pentecostal message. message. He started holding meetings in a converted livery, livery stable. So in other words, where the horses were. At 312 Azusa Street, there was a mighty revival that lasted for three years. This revival launched the modern day Pentecostal movement. And so this truth was once again restored to the church. Now, in uh, Acts chapter 10, we see another incidence where there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember on the day of Pentecost, um, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, there's the second incidence where we see speaking in tongues um, sort of mentioned with uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. While Peter was still speaking, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was actually even prior to them to being baptized in water. And then in Acts 19, it says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. So Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. So all those people, though, although these people had already been baptized in water, it was John's baptism. So what does Paul do? He actually baptizes them again in the name of the Lord Jesus, because John's baptism was prior to Jesus dying. Our baptism symbolizes death and burial with Christ and a resurrection to a new life in which we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. Okay, so on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues. And notice they also prophesied as well. So this is the third instance where we see tongues mentioned. But this, on this occasion, is accompanied with prophecy. So we have seen that there should be power demonstrated in the lives of those who are spiritual boldness, joy at times, the miraculous, and in some cases, even the willingness to die for their faith. However, speaking in tongues occurs in three out of the five instances that are mentioned in Scripture of the initial baptism of the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost, tongues, Cornelius and his household, tongues, Ephesian believers, tongues, and prophecy. In Paul's case, in Acts chapter 9, when he is prayed for by um, Ananias, there's no mention of tongues. And Simon the sorcerer, um, when he offered money to the disciples to have the gift, there's no mention of tongues there. But you'll notice that um, in the case of Paul, he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 18 to 19, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So it's quite clear that he did speak in tongues. But he does go on to say, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. The only purpose uh, that tongues has in the church is when it is accompanied by uh, interpretation. And even then, in Acts chapter 4, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, they told not to bring more than three. And if there's nobody who can interpret, they uh, are actually to refrain. So my own personal fe uh, feeling is that the, the main purpose of tongues is self-edification. It's uh, for our own personal time with the Lord where we can pray in the spirit and we can pray in tongues. As I said, I 
kind of grew up in a sort of like environment in the Pentecostal church where you were almost classified as a second class citizen if you couldn't speak in tongues. And that's a dangerous thing, you know, and, uh, and then you end up getting these people who try and coach people how to speak in tongues and all this kind of nonsense, you know. The only other occasion then of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is in Acts 8. And um, it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they may receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They simply had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Although there is no reference to speaking in tongues or some other manifestation of the Spirit, it's almost certain that something out of the ordinary happened to prompt Simon to offer Peter money to be able to pray for people to receive this gift. The Assemblies of God USA has speaking in tongues as an initial sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on their website position paper. Um, and that's what they believe, that it is the initial sign that there should be an accompaniment of speaking in tongues. And I am of similar persuasion, but whatever the case is, and I, I don't want to be dogmatic about this, one thing's for sure is there, there must be some demonstration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Goosebumps are not enough. Um, you know, uh, Simon, something prompted him to, to offer money. So there must have been something that uh, happened that was out of the ordinary. Now, just to go on to being filled with the Holy Spirit, and this, you mustn't equate to the initial filling. Yes, the, there needs to be obviously that initial filling, but you know, you can fill your tank with petrol and after you've ridden around it, but it's not going to be full anymore. Now, it says in Ephesians 5, 18, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Now, that be filled is in the continuous in the Greek, and it, it means be being filled. It's a state, continuous state of being filled. And we can see this in Acts chapter 4, because... Remember, in Acts chapter 2, you had this initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And here, two chapters later, it says, after these guys had been threatened not to speak in the name of Jesus, they say, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal. Perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting, where, me, where they were meeting, was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now, to me, the evidence of the Holy Spirit here is not the place being shaken. You know, if we're going to go to church and we believe the Holy Spirit hasn't come until the actual building has been shaken, you know, you may be there for a good number of years, and it never takes place. The evidence of the Holy Spirit coming upon them was that they spoke the word of God boldly. That is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And you know, sometimes you get people, I mean, there was this thing a couple of years ago where everybody had to laugh. And then there was the nonsense where there had to be gold dust. And, um, you know, people come along with these scams and uh, with these acts and putting on. And, you know, if you had the Holy Spirit, you had to fall over on the ground and there was somebody conveniently to catch you so you didn't bang your head and all this kind of stuff. Or throw... A cloth over you to cover, you know, cover the woman if they fall on the ground. And, you know, all this kind of thing has, you know, brought the filling of the Holy Spirit into disrepute. Um, just an interesting thing that I saw on when I was looking at the AGF website, um, I want to read to you. It's just this page. Is tongues the only evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Will there be any significant changes in one's attitude and actions? after being baptized in the Spirit. 
The first physical sign of the infilling of the Spirit is speaking in tongues, according to the guy who wrote this article. This is one physical sign that is consistent in its recurrence, as pointed out earlier. However, the baptism is not a goal, but a gateway. It is a door to, the, to Spirit-filled living. It marks a beginning, not an end. Speaking in tongues is but the initial evidence and is to be followed by all the evidences of Christ-likeness that mark a consistent spirit life, spirit-filled life. The Apostle Paul described this wonderful life in the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. He wrote, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is a life to be lived, not just an experience to be remembered. Some have missed this essential distinction. They have been satisfied to recall that wonderful moment when the Holy Spirit came in his fullness, and they magnified the Lord in other tongues. Failure to progress beyond that point is tragedy. Okay, Gav, I'm going to hand over to you. And then after you've finished, Gav, if you want to just allow time for some questions. Okay. You can, have you stopped your share there, Ken? I have now. Okay. I'm sorry that that was a rush, but I wanted Gavin just to add. I'm going to move. Yeah, no, thanks. That was a very interesting. Okay, Ken just asked me um, to just touch on this. So I obviously won't give the full presentation, um, but just to tell you the difference between the prepositions that we find in the Greek that are very significant theologically. And so there's three Greek words that we need to remember and they're nice easy ones. They're not tongue twisters like some of the Greek words. They are para, en, and epi. Para means with you. And this is, these are three prepositions that are used to uh, describe our relationship with the Holy Spirit. So it speaks about the Holy Spirit being with you. So the Holy Spirit is with the person even before they converted. Because Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit convicting the world of sin and convincing them, obviously, that Jesus is the Savior. But then there's N, which is in you. And that happens at salvation. So he's no longer just with you, but he's, he's in you, living inside you. And then there's a third one, which is epi, which is upon you. And that is separate and distinct from the first two. And that is the one that we as Pentecostals equate with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So firstly, para, with you. Jesus, at the Last Supper, when he was telling his disciples that he was going away and they were very sorrowful, he promised them that he wouldn't, go, wouldn't leave them as orphans, but that he would send the Holy Spirit. And he said, unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So the conviction of sin um, is through the Holy Spirit, even with the unbeliever. So when we look at the second preposition in you, when we get saved, he's no longer just with you, but he is in you. He's no longer just alongside convicting you of sin. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. So he's to be with you. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with, that's para, you and will be in you. So he's not just with us but he is in us. And that's why 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, Paul says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in, in you, whom you receive from God. So when you are saved, the Holy Spirit no longer is alongside, he is in you. So that's why those who don't, uh, the denominations that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit will always say that you receive the Holy Spirit at conversion. They're correct. You do receive the Holy Spirit at conversion. 
And that's why as Pentecostals, we believe that there's a third experience, the epi experience. But when you are converted, you do have the Holy Spirit because your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit within, uh, in you, you, you don't belong to God. And so every believer has the Holy Spirit in him. It begins the sanctifying work, which Ken was speaking about, transforming us into the image of Christ. And he brings conviction of sin also to the Christian because he's a Holy Spirit. And as such, he's grieved when we sin. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, we mustn't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So every Christian has the Holy Spirit as a seal. And so there are verses to show that the Holy Spirit makes us holy, he sanctifies us. Romans 15 verse 16, so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And keeps on speaking about the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Now that he's in us, because he's a Holy Spirit, he convicts us of sin even more intensely, but he also starts producing a godly character. And that's why if you've been saved, and this has got nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this every Christian should have, which is the fruit. So it says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And again, such thing there is no law. What the point he's making is that when you have the Holy Spirit within you, the righteous requirements of the law are met in you because this is the kind of fruit that is manifest in your life. And there's no law against those fruit. There's no law against love, joy, and peace. Okay. But the point is, even a person who hasn't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit should have the fruit because this is because the Holy Spirit is in you and the sanctification work is there. And fruit is not an option. So you might well say, well, I don't have all the gifts of the Spirit, but you can't say, well, I don't have all the fruit. You can't say, well, I've got love, but I don't have any patience and I'm not kind, but I am faithful. Okay, it doesn't work. The fruit of the Spirit, all the fruit should be evidence in every Christian. It's not, you know, that one fruit's given to one and another is given to other, as we see with the gifts. And so there is this third preposition, epi, upon you. So remember, he was with you before conversion. When you got saved, your body became a temple of the Holy Spirit and he was in you and he started sanctifying you and producing fruit in you. But as Pentecostals, we believe that the epi experience, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is unique and it's distinct from the end experience, which is salvation. And that's why when Jesus, speaking of Pentecost, said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, epi, upon you. And so in the Greek, that means upon or over, and that is the empowering of the believer for service to God. It generates an outward flow of the Holy Spirit that Jesus spoke of in John 7, streams of living water flowing from our inmost being, and by this he meant the Holy Spirit. It's visible by both service and victory. I found this interesting, D.L. Moody, and this is before the advent of Pentecost. Well, when I say Pentecost, I'm not talking about the Pentecost in the book of Acts. I'm talking about the Pentecost revival in the 20th century. He was in the 19th century, and he wrote an article called The Baptism of the Holy Spirit for Service. In some sense, he said, and to some extent, the Holy Spirit dwells with every believer. But there is another gift, which may be called the gift of the Holy Spirit for service. This gift, it strikes me, is entirely distinct and separate from conversion and assurance. And I believe that Moody was spot on there. God has a great many children that have no power. And the reason is they have not the gift of the Holy Ghost for service. God doesn't seem to work with them. And I believe it is because they have not sought this gift. So here's just a brief overview of it. Para in epi. Para, he is with you. He's with the unbeliever. The purpose is to convict of sin and draw to Christ. In, he is in you. 
the new believer. Your body is a temple. He comforts you. He sanctifies you. Produces all that fruit of the Spirit. If he, upon you, a believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit, which you believe is distinct, and it is an anointing, and it's with that anointing that's associated the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So John said that Jesus would be the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this epi experience is something that we can equate with the term anointing. So bear in mind, he's with you before you're saved. He's in you when you're saved. But when he comes upon you, it's, uh, remember, we talk about it as being the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is immersion in the Greek. The Greek uh, baptizo meant, meant immerse. So it's literally now you are immersed in the Holy Spirit. Just like that person who goes under the water, you are totally immersed in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, epi, because he has anointed me. It's linked to the anointing. And what he's been anointed for? To preach the gospel to the poor. Remember, you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover your sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. And so the anointing imparts power to do good and to destroy the work, works of the devil. Acts 10 verse 38 says that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. And so with the anointing comes the gifts. Remember, the fruit comes when he's in you, and you should have all the fruit. You don't necessarily have all the gifts, but we have the gifts, uh, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. The interesting thing is the gifts are not given for your own benefit. They're given for the benefit of others. So as Ken says, we don't get given the gifts so we can compare notes and see who's got more gifts and who's of a higher spiritual rank than someone else. They're not for your benefit anyway. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 says, To each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12, So it is with you, since you're eager to have spiritual gifts, Try to excel in gifts that build up the church. So the purpose of the gifts aren't for your own benefit or for your own credentials or to wear as, you know, things on your outfit like um, the people in the military do. It is for the benefit of others, for the common good to build up the church. And that's why Jesus, speaking of this in John 7, said, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water, will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit. So those rivers of living water flowing from within you are not just for your benefit. They to provide blessing to others by flowing from without you. Others can drink from the streams of living water that are flowing from within you. And it's possible to have the end experience without the epi. And this is where we differ, obviously, from some of the traditional churches where they acknowledge the fact that the Holy Spirit is uh, with you before conversion. They acknowledge the fact that he comes in you at conversion, but they don't see this separate experience because they believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one and the same with conversion. But we find cases of people who were believers and yet they weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 8, Ken mentioned this. The apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. So they'd listened to Philip preaching and they'd accepted the word of God. In other words, they were converted. But they hadn't received the Holy Spirit because it says that they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon Epi, any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Baptism into the name of the Lord Jesus is the baptism with conversion. Remember this, uh, the three main baptisms. When you're saved, you're baptized into the Lord Jesus, and it's the Holy Spirit who does the baptizing. Uh, baptism in water, it's another believer who does the baptizing. But baptism in the Holy Spirit is done by Jesus, because John the Baptist said, Jesus is greater than me because he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You find that when Jesus' disciples were sent out in ministry, they were saved. They had to be saved. I mean, they cast out demons, they healed the sick, they came back rejoicing, but they hadn't yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that only came at Pentecost. On one occasion, he sent out 12, and another occasion, he sent out 70. And so Jesus speaks of those who believed in him who would receive the Spirit later. So you can have the in experience without the epi. They were saved, but they hadn't received the anointing yet. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me as the Spirit, as the Scripture said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And it goes on to say, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So they already believed in him. They were already disciples, but they received it later at Pentecost, the epi experience, a distinct experience. And then this is one that Ken alluded to as well. In Acts chapter 19, where Paul encounters in Ephesus people who are called disciples. So they weren't unsaved. They called disciples, but they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit baptism. And Paul says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So in their case, it was a lack of teaching. And the response of Paul, we'll find, if you read that passage, is to firstly give them instruction. He then baptizes them in water, and then he prays for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he lays his hand on them. The primary purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not to fall over, is not to get goosebumps, and it's not to speak in tongues. It's not to prophesy to them. The primary purpose for the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not even to perform miracles. Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will get goosebumps. Okay, and get a tingly feeling, no? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So if you claim to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, do you have a passion for evangelism and missions? Because that's what he's talking about. Being my witnesses in Jerusalem, that was evangelism. Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, that is missions. So the primary purpose uh, of the ba uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the gifts are great. And as Ken mentioned, tongues for self-edification, but the others are all for building up the church. But the purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is to empower us to be more effective witnesses. And how does he do that? Because firstly, he teaches us what to say. Jesus said, when you're brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And the other thing, as we've already heard, is that he emboldens us. And we see this particularly in Peter. Remember, Peter loved the Lord. Peter had been one of the 12. He'd been one of the 70. And yet, before he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he lacked boldness because he denies that he even knows the Lord to a servant girl. And yet, a few weeks later, this man who was uh, denying the Lord to a servant girl is standing up proclaiming the gospel, to, even to those who crucified Jesus. And he even stands before the Sanhedrin, which was the court that convicted Jesus and were instrumental in having him put to death by the Romans. And he says to them, you crucified the Lord of glory. And he speaks of boldness. And that verse that we saw earlier, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So we can be much more effective in our evangelism and missions work with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because not only do we have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit teaching us what to say, we also have the boldness that is not our own boldness. Amen.